Oh, that is. Wait, that's working. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Hello, my name is Angela Sheeran and I am the Shakespeare Whisperer and this is Dr. Peter Groves and we are continuing with our series on Measure for Measure and we are picking up right where we left off last episode which was at whew, the end of a hot little interchange between Angelo and Isabella. So we are in Act 2, Scene 2 and we are around line 100 and... 55, 55, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we recommend that you have your own copy of the play to read along with us. And if this is the first time you're joining us, we recommend that you start at the start. Because yes. the videos do build upon each other. They do. And we'll be referring to things we've said before. Exactly, exactly. All right. Yeah. And in fact, um, he's finally, he's finally getting her out of the room. So he can, he can... Uh, ponder on what's actually been going on. Mm. Interesting, her last words here, heaven keep your honour safe, amen, says Angela Wasside, are actually, um, they've got a missing initial offbeat. It's what you call a headless line. I know this is, a, what it means is that it's slightly more emphatic than normal because it's slightly more abrupt. Heaven keep your honour safe, amen. Yeah. So it's worth, worth noting these things. Mm. Um. Yeah, I guess that kind of emphasises the way that she's sort of been... Yes, a dominant. Attacking them. Yes, yeah. she's very... Yes, exactly, very forceful in this whole scene. Yeah. That's exactly right. And he's just kind of reeling from the blows. Mm. We, we, we had the metaphor of a kind of prize fight earlier on. He's, yeah. He's virtually out for the count here. For I'm going that way to temptation with prayers crossed. It's, it's an interesting uh, reading there because... The folio reads prayers cross, as though uh, you know you might be praying for two different things and it's put in different ways. Oh, I love that. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's what my edition has. Oh, it does. Prayers, prayers cross. Oh, there we are. Well, that was the folio reading. My edition, which is the second, pardon, ancient, as you can see, <laughs> has prayers crossed. And uh, editors will argue forever about these matters, of course. Mm, it's so a, it's something very interesting, though, to, to think about. The different things of meaning. Well, yeah. So the one is prayers cross. So you you want different things. You're yeah. like, oh, please let me be holy and not sleep with this woman, but also like, please let me sleep with this exactly. woman. Exactly. I think that's much more uh, to the point <laughs> than simply prayers crossed, where you want to be holy, but it's somehow thwarted by something else. I think that's much more an interest, much more interesting. I, I feel like the other one because the second one's not really a prayer. You're not like, no. please, like well, I guess it kind of is. Whereas <laughs> where prayers well, cross. But like maybe, prayers with apostrophe. Yeah, but maybe for Angelo, I mean, anything he wants is, is, is worthy of prayer. I mean, maybe he thinks almost in that way, isn't it? Potentially. But the point is, you can argue, you can argue forever, you can argue for both these readings. Mm, What's more, work. E in secretary hand is easily mistaken for D, so, so ultimately we'll never know. Mm. <laughs> I also like the double meaning in... When Isabella says, heaven keep your honour safe, and he says, amen, she meaning like you, your honour, like to a judge. So heaven keep you safe. Yes. He says, amen, for I am going to temptation, meaning like keep my honour safe. Yes. Like keep my my virtue and my yes. holiness. My integrity. My inte yeah, and perhaps yes. even my reputation as well safe. Yes, so it exactly. It picks up on that fun dog exactly. meaning that she didn't intend. Yes, that's right. Mm. That's right. Um... At what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? Um, and again, I mentioned before that he overlaps her, line 155, to nothing terrible. Well, come, they can come to you tomorrow. That is to say, he begins his second half line before she's finished the first half line, which is a technique Shakespeare uses to show people uh, impatiently interrupting, or interrupting for all sorts of reasons, really. But here again, he's terribly keen to get rid of her, so he overlaps her again. See, when well, he you say, you save your honour. Uh, save your honour. From the, no, no. Oh, I'll try again. Say it again. Oh, I thought it was happening earlier. At what hour shall I attend your lordship any time for me? Yeah. No, it's at the end. Um, huh, um, well, yeah, that is an overlap, but it's an overlap in an Alexandrine, which is a kind of technical oddity. However, you're right. Mm. So he does it three times within, the, to show it's deliberate. Yeah. Okay, well, try that. 
Uh, at what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? At any time for noon. Save your honor. Oh, for me, even for my virtue. <laughs> <laughs> so he's very kind of jumpy, but also he's just desperate to get her out of the room because mm. he can't think when she's there. And if we're not quite as technically sophisticated as Peter in, in picking up on these on these overlaps, what what we can notice is simply looking at the structure of structure of the lines that we've mentioned shared lines or split lines before. This whole interchange here is shared lines. They continually finish off each other's lines and, and pick up mm. where each other leaves off within the same line. That's right. Um, and if you count them, you can actually see what's going on. Save your honour. That's um, four syllables. So he's only got um, six or possibly seven, 11 syllables, uh, seven syllables left. But in fact, he's got eight there. Even from the mm. So that's one way of, 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 of it's, it's a crude way of doing it, but you know, you can see what's going on. But uh, mm -hmm. it's a numerical thing. She's showing this kind of dominance. And he's desperate to get her out. Yes. Okay, let's go. Let's go yeah. now. Yes, that's I right. I can leave. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> oh, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. But you're, you're right, because that's also a headless line. Save your honour. It's another. So, in fact, you can see that these are quite deliberate, these devices. I'm, I won't carry on too much about them, but, you know, it's something I find very interesting. Mm. So, finally, he's on his own. And he starts analyzing. Okay, so, he, so even before this, when Isabella says, save your honor, and he, she then leaves, and he says to himself, everyone leaves, he says to himself, from thee, even from thy virtue. So mm. again, that's picking up on that, heaven keep your sa honor safe, amen, again. Um, yes, yes, exactly. exactly. This double meaning of honor, meaning like, yeah, indeed, my honor's in grave danger here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you can see how agitated he is because of the way the syntax is broken up and jerky and choppy. What's this? What's this? Is it a fault of mine? So he's, he's not, this isn't rational deliberation analysis. Yeah. This is somebody really kind of wrestling with what seems like an immediate problem. And, and it's, it's quite interesting that he doesn't, as you might expect, immediately start blaming her, which is, you know, the kind of the standard. <laughs> standard um, practice, if you like, to offload the temptation onto the woman. I'm a holy, virtuous man, but this terrible woman is tempting me with her lewdness. Um, the tempter or the tempted, who sins most, huh? Mm. He says. Yeah, he starts off that way. What's this? What's this? Is it her fault or mine? Yes. <laughs> so, like, it should be her fault. Exactly. But, but, but he's yeah, too he honest. Yeah. I mean, he, he does have this capacity for introspection. There is a genuine desire for politics, for piety, for holiness in him. Mm. The tempter or the tempted, who spoke, it, 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 I just remember that in fact he begins um, this scene by saying that it is one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. Yeah. <laughs> so being tempted isn't a sin at all, as long as you don't approve it, you know. Although here he seems to think it is the well, tempter or the tempted who sins yes. most. Yes. So it, being tempted is a sin. Well, the, yes, exactly. Well, um, yeah. well, giving way to it. I think that's what he's afraid of. Isn't it? mm. It's like like Macbeth giving way to the you know the seduction of the witches. Mm. Why do I yield to that suggestion? So it's it's one thing to be tempted, and another thing to give in to it, even if even if you don't follow through, even if you don't actually mm. take it to the next step. But he he seems to. Confute, to confuse that distinction here. Mm. Who sins most implies that we're both sinning, yeah. the tempter and the tempted. Yeah. So just by being tempted. Exactly. But whereas I'm, tempting isn't necessarily a sin at all. It can be... Yeah, it can be genuinely unconscious. Yeah. Well, well exactly. Well, like a cream cake can tempt you, but <laughs> the cream cake can't commit sin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, also, tempting... It's maybe a legitimate means of testing somebody, you know. Mm. So it's quite complicated. And he's, it's as though he's looking in that line for a way out. If I can shovel all the blame onto her, I'm okay, I'm in the clear. But he won't let himself take that out. Not she, he says, nor does she tempt. No, she's not doing this deliberately, he says to himself. Yeah. She's just being herself. Which is interesting because, spoiler alert, Angelo is 
seen as the bad guy of this plane. He gets he gets bad. He does some bad stuff. But it's interesting that we see here he's able to perform this introspection to be honest with himself and to look at himself so much more than our supposed heroic characters. Exactly. Like the Duke or Isabella, he's able to stop and say, "What's going on here? Yeah, I right. need to take responsibility for this. This is on me." That's right, and, and more so than all the all the people nowadays who will blame a woman for sexual assault by saying that she was, you know, tempting me by wearing, you know, immodest clothing. Sure, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't make any such kind of inference. Mm. Not she, nor does she tempt, but it is I. It is I. And this wonderful image that follows, that lying by the violet in the sun, do as the carrion does. So he's a piece of rotting meat lying by a violet, a soup-smelling violet. And He's doing as the rotting meat is, not as the flower. He's corrupting with virtuous season. So he's corrupting, but the, the sweet smell of the violet is seasoning his corruption so it's not obvious, like skimming over the fault mm. earlier on. I never understood. Well, that's, you, you don't smell the rotting meat because of the violet. Well, I mean, you probably would, actually, <laughs> <laughs> practical terms. But, yeah, the violet, so the violet is, is partly, you know, what he appears to be. It's also, I suppose, in a way, Isabella. It's, it's, it's an interesting, one of those fascinating Shakespeare metaphors which are all kind of bound up and intricate, where mm. the parts are referring to several things at once. So, as I said, the violet, he, he's the rotting meat, certainly. His desires are the rotting meat. Um, but the violet is both Isabella, who is sweet and innocent, but also the appearance he gives to the world, which is seasoning with a sweet smelling cover the actual foul corruption within mm. so he's <laughs> he had a lot more insight into himself than hamlet or so many yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fascinating can it be that modesty may more betray our sense of woman's lightness? Having waste ground enough. So, again, he put, to say modesty may betray our sense of woman's lightness is a sort of slight effort to shove it back onto her. As though she's deliberately being non-like, you know, because she knows it's a bit kinky and people <laughs> are turned on by. Um, but no, having, he then brings it back to himself. Having waste ground enough, shall we desire to raise the sanctuary and pitch our heels there? Um, so, in fact, it's his own corruption that isn't satisfied with, um, well, yes, going out and finding a prostitute, if you like. He's got to corrupt, he's got to despoil this pure, the innocent, sanctuary. the sanctuary. Yes. Um, you explained to me what this literally means as well. Pitch our evils there means to like construct our portaloos yes, in that exactly. area. Exactly. So it's a, like a really <laughs> yes. vivid and upsetting imagery it is rather, of going yes. into this yes, that's sanctuary, <laughs> this church, this holy ground, and setting up um, yes. our waste pits or whatever. Exactly. Well, a bit like the uh, the recent rioters in the Capitol in, in Washington who smeared feces everywhere, apparently. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so he's got a powerful sense of, well, the wrongness of what he's doing, if you like. No what question. he's tempted to what do. What he's tempted yeah. to do, yes. Yeah. What he's tempted to do. What dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? You know, what, what are you doing? What kind of person are you that, that you feel like this? That you can, you know. I love that question. What yes. dost thou, or what art thou? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's going one deeper. Mm. Not what you're you, but what, what are you? But Which is um, kind of the Christian idea as well, of like you're not defined by your deeds, yes. you're defined by what you are. Yes. So there's a, a level deeper than that. That's right, that's right. As in a child of God, meaning what you are. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? There's a kind of... It, He's acknowledging kind of perversity in his desires here. Yeah, and he's bang on as well. Oh, if she yeah. had come in 
But he says this later anyway, that if she had come in all like tart it up and yes. like, hey handsome, That's he right. would have been able to resist, but she caught him so unawares and off guard yeah. because she was so holy and pure. Mm. Even though we can notice the, the the splits and double meanings in her language that she's not aware of. Yes. Which is, at this stage he's not aware of either. He doesn't yes. say, Hey girl, you know, a bit of bit of ambiguity there in your language. He just <laughs> thinks, right. Oh, she's completely unconscious of what she's doing. Exactly, exactly. So the play raises very interesting questions about you know, what are we, what do we do? How do we do on what level are we doing it? Are we fully conscious when we do certain mm. kinds of thing or are we partly unconscious? Um, it's quite complicated and quite interesting, and it raises interesting questions about you know, sin and punishment and guilt, and which of course is at the heart of the play itself. The play itself is about the, you know, the unjust punishment that leads to all this. So, yeah, mm. fascinating stuff. Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. Which is, you know, fair She's enough. The argument that she was making. That's right. <laughs> Not go to your bosom and <laughs> see, right. see if you can relate exactly. to my brother's sin. Well, yeah, I can. Exactly, exactly. What? Do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? I like that line because I think she does suggest something like what we recognise as love, doesn't it? Yeah. Feast upon her eyes. Not upon her any other part of her anatomy, which I won't mention. But her eyes, mm. you know, the windows to the soul. So it's actually quite interesting, isn't it? That um, it's not, it's, but it's clearly not just lust. It's even though he's accusing himself in this rather sort of harsh way, it's something more complex and more interesting. Mm. It's a relation to another human being, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's what is attracted to her, and him to her is not her desirability. Her, visual desirability or whatever, and in fact he wasn't moved by that at all when she first entered. It was her, her passion, her intellectual engagement, her forcefulness. These things were what actually made him Yeah. Kind of, I mean, I'm not sure we can quite say he's in love with her because of the way he behaves towards her, or if he does, he quickly divests himself of it, but there's something of that in, in, in his approach to her that is actually a personal engagement and love. I totally agree. I think those lines taken in isolation are super romantic. Mm. What do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again? And like you said, it's it's to hear her speak. It's not that I desire to look at her yes. again. I desire to hear her speak again. Yes. Feast upon her eyes. Yeah. That is, yeah. And he's not, he's not here deceiving anybody. I mean, trying to deceive anybody. I, I'm not even sure he's trying to deceive himself here. With this. So, well, maybe, maybe it's, it's more subtle than. No, I think he really is taken with her and impressed. And yes. I mean, in ways, she would be a really good match for him. Yes, like both, well, that's right. You know, they're both um, driven by principle, or so they think. They're both very intense people. They're both very intelligent, very passionate, very intellectual. Like exactly, great dinner, you know, breakfast table conversation. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> um, no, this is this is true, and and you see, I think the point about all this is that um, because he has. He's not being tempted all his life, and he's quite young, um, because he's had this sort of very pious, such adolescent kind of piety, that he feels himself above such lowly things. When this temptation does come, he doesn't know how to deal with it. He's completely discombobulated, and that's that's important. He's helpless. Um, and it, it's like, as we said before, it psychologically makes sense as yeah. well. If he had been more. Um, integrated within himself and his sexuality had been integrated and it had just been stuffed down shame 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 and overcompensating that's right and he could could acknowledge like yeah you know i struggle with this too you know claudius like i can relate and everything and been a bit more reasonable and integrated and then when she came along potentially he could have yeah wooed her properly and feasted upon her eyes and recognized that because i have these sexual desires that doesn't mean i am a devil and i have to behave like one that exactly. doesn't mean i have to have control and go from all or nothing go from intense yes. above desire to like well as we'll see you know kind of a monster yes exactly. it would be more integrated and he's saying yeah. you know whoa nary okay i'm feeling these things how can i manifest and express them in a healthy way exactly right exactly right You've got to sort of wrestle with these things. And if you just bash them down into a box and nail the lid down, which is what he does, and then sit on the, sit on the box with the <laughs> yeah. monster inside, yeah. when it gets out, you've got no way of dealing with it. Because yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to have the practice of wrestling with it. It's very interesting, though, Shakespeare's comedies, always about young people, and they're about people 
doing exactly this, um, dealing with desire and, and you know how to moderate it and, and, and so on. And, and it's practice, a bit like play, you know, it's kind of play in a sense. A comedy is a place of play. And he's never had that play, he's never had that, uh, mm. any more than Isabella has, of course, too, with Ivan. Mm. The Duke is a different question, of course, a different matter. There are different ways of <laughs> getting it wrong, perhaps, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Um, what is thy dream on? And then he... Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> it goes downhill. He does, rather. <laughs> His egotism returns, his pride. Mm. Oh, cunning enemy that to catch a saint, that's him. All of a sudden he's a saint again, with saints just bait by hook. Um, yeah. Mm. So it, there's, there's a lovely uh, quotation from T.S. Eliot. He says, humankind can't bear very much reality. You, know, you can stay into the pit for a little while, but then you've got to retreat and build your defences up again. So true. It's yeah. so psychologically true. Absolutely. So he's seen this to some extent and he's recoiled from it and he's now building himself up again. He's bigging himself up. Mm. He's the saint. And the devil to tempt him has put a saint on his hook, you know. Mm. Um. <laughs> Which was a, a kind of a, a trope, the idea that you know saints would be tempted with Well the ideas of like holy women or something because they can kind of get under their radar. I suppose so, yes. I think well, St. Anthony in the desert was of course tempted by, well, just by women. Well, they weren't women, of course, they were succubi, weren't they? Mm. But yes, no, it's an interesting idea, isn't it? Yeah, I because... think there's a footnote in my, in my Arden 2 edition <laughs> about that that said that, that there was this idea of holy men being tempted by, you know, the devil producing visions of Holy women. Oh, here we are, yes. See the representation of La Diable en Femme in Dijon's Christian iconography, where the devil is a woman with arms outstretched in supplication. Angela imagined himself as an anchorite, that's a, a hermit who lives in, in caves in the desert, tempted in a dream by Satan disguised as a virgin saint. So that must be the note you're thinking of. Yeah. Mm, interesting, very interesting. Yeah. Never could the strumpet, with all her double vigour, art and nature, by art, of course, he means cosmetics and so on, and, you know, behaviour, once stir my temper, but this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Subdues me quite. Of course, it's, it's absolutely true. He has, she has, in a sense, subdued him in all sorts of ways. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Ever, ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled. Fond is such a good word here, of course, because it means two things. It means affectionate in the modern sense of fond, but it's also in Elizabethan English it means foolish. King Lear says, I'm a very foolish, fond old man. And so behind that double meaning of the word fond is the idea that affection is a very anti Christian idea, the idea that, that love lays you open, makes you vulnerable, makes you weak. Mm. Like, you know, the warrior who falls in love is emasculated. So it's it's an insight into his way of thinking and, and how, in fact, far removed it is from a, a, an essentially Christian ethic, mm. if you have to say. It, is it the same way? Infatuate has the same idea because you say someone's infatuated. Of course, that means they're made silly, fatuous, <laughs> by desire, by love. I didn't know that, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. That's quite perfect. Yeah. So, off he goes, and wow, what a scene. <laughs> um, should we, 24 minutes oh, tonight? Oh, we could, we could, we could yeah. Aaron, okay. start the next one. Okay. Um, I'll try. Hi, Bixby. Stop the recording. <laughs> no, I don't think that worked. Never mind. <laughs>